Imagine the world's power plants humming along, not on steam, but on a supercharged form of carbon dioxide. For over a century, steam turbines have been the beating hearts of our electricity grids, churning out power by boiling water into high-pressure steam. But now, engineers across the globe are whispering of a revolution, a turbine fueled not by water vapor, but by carbon dioxide pressed into a supercritical state. This isn't science fiction. Supercritical CO2 turbines are real, and they promise to squeeze far more power out of every drop of heat. Think of a turbine spinning on the very CO2 your car exhales. Hard to believe? Let's dive in. Flip a switch in your home, and the lights blaze on thanks to steam. In the conventional setup, we burn fuel to heat water in a massive boiler, converting it into steam. That steam blasts past turbine blades, spinning them, and rotates a generator to make electricity. Steam turbines have been incredibly reliable. Even today, about 80% of the world's electricity comes from turbines driven by steam, whether from coal, gas, or nuclear plants. But here's the catch. Only about a third to two-fifths of the heat energy in the fuel actually becomes electricity. The rest is lost as waste heat out of cooling towers or exhausts. In other words, our steam power plants have lots of waste energy, a problem engineers have been trying to fix for decades. We've pushed steam technology as far as it can go. Today's ultra-supercritical coal or nuclear plants run boilers at staggering conditions, roughly 600 degrees Celsius, and pressures around 350 bar, over 5,000 PSI. That does gain a bit more efficiency, now around 40 to 45 percent, but it's brutally hard on the machines. The steel and nickel alloys in boilers and turbines get red hot, and at those temperatures they start to creep, crack, or corrode. Push any harder, and components start to fail. Even the most advanced steam plants in the world only reach roughly the low 40% range. It's like wringing out a wet towel. Eventually you're squeezing every last drop, and there's nothing more to get. That realization has engineers asking. To go beyond this, do we need a new working fluid entirely? The surprising answer is, use CO2. Yes, carbon dioxide. The same gas we worry about warming the planet can actually become the hero in our turbines. Under ordinary conditions, CO2 is a colorless gas, but if you squeeze it above about 74 bar, roughly 1,070 psi, and heat it above about 31 degrees Celsius, it enters a supercritical state. In this supercritical phase, CO2 acts like both a liquid and a gas at once. It flows easily like a gas, but carries heat like a liquid. The result is a working fluid that can absorb and deliver more energy than steam ever could. In fact, the CO2 in that turbine might even start as captured emissions, putting a waste gas to work. The entire plant is a closed-loop CO2 cycle. Engineers charge the system with CO2 at the beginning, usually from an industrial supply or captured stream. And thereafter, it just circulates over and over. The CO2 isn't burned or released. It stays contained in pipes and machinery. A compressor keeps it at high pressure, and any small leaks are simply topped off. Essentially, the same carbon dioxide does all the work over and over. It's like filling a pump with water once and letting it run indefinitely. So when we say using CO2 as a fluid, we aren't burning CO2 as fuel. We're just letting it work inside a sealed turbine cycle. This clever reuse means no new CO2 is produced by the cycle itself. Reaching supercritical conditions for CO2 is much easier than it sounds. We often talk about supercritical water. Some experimental reactors do that. But water's critical point is 374 degrees Celsius 
and 220 bar, extreme even for modern boilers. CO2 by comparison becomes supercritical at only 31 degrees Celsius and 74 bar, though in our power cycle we operate it much hotter, like 500 to 700 degrees Celsius. Once it's supercritical, tiny changes in temperature or pressure cause huge density shifts in CO2. That's gold for engineers because it means small tweaks can absorb or release large amounts of heat. In short, in the right conditions, CO2 becomes an incredibly effective fluid for carrying thermal energy. Here's how the supercritical CO2 turbine cycle works, step by step. First, the CO2 gas is squeezed by a compressor pump. Compressing it to high pressure actually heats it up a bit, physics of compression. So the fluid enters the next stage already warm. This compression step is analogous to the compressor in a jet engine. Unlike steam, which changes from liquid to vapor, CO2 stays in one supercritical phase, so no energy is lost in a phase change. After compression, the CO2 is at high pressure and moderately hot, ready for the big heat input. Next, the hot pressurized CO2 flows through a heater, a high temperature heat exchanger. Here it's heated dramatically, either by burning fuel in a boiler, by nuclear reactor heat, by concentrated sunlight, e.g. solar tower, or even by industrial waste heat. The temperature can climb to 600 to 700 degrees Celsius or more. Think of this like the combustion chamber of a jet engine, except we keep the fuel and the working fluid separate. The CO2 gets red hot and energy packed as it leaves this heater. That super hot, high pressure CO2 then blasts through the turbine. As it expands, it drives the turbine blades around spinning the shaft. This shaft is connected to a generator, producing electricity. It works like a steam turbine in principle, but here a much smaller flow of much denser CO2 does the pushing. The turbines can spin extremely fast, often on the order of 20,000 to 30,000 RPM. One test turbine design for 10 megawatts runs at about 27,000 RPM. Despite its tiny size, that 10 megawatt SCO2 turbine can power on the order of 10,000 homes. That's because CO2 is so dense that even a desk-sized turbine can have huge output. But the story doesn't end when the CO2 exits the turbine. Instead of dumping its remaining heat to the environment, the hot exhaust passes through a recuperator, a special heat exchanger. There, it transfers most of its leftover heat back into the incoming compressed CO2. In effect, the turbine exhaust heats the cold CO2 before it goes back to the main heater. This clever recycling step dramatically boosts efficiency because it means we need far less extra fuel to reheat the CO2 every cycle. After giving up its heat to the recuperator, the CO2 cools a bit in a cooler, often air or water cooled, and then returns to the compressor pump, completing the loop. By capturing that exhaust heat internally, these plants lose far less energy than traditional steam systems. One of the most exciting advantages of SCO2 is sheer compactness. Supercritical CO2 is about 10 times denser than steam at equivalent conditions, so the turbines and compressors can be much smaller. Engineers have demonstrated units where a turbine the size of a desk powers a neighborhood of homes. Imagine a power plant where the turbine hall fits in a single warehouse instead of needing skyscrapers. This miniaturization slashes construction costs and speeds up building. For contrast, think of a 10 megawatt steam turbine complex it might weigh hundreds of tons and need big support structures. An equivalent SCO2 turbine might weigh a few tens of tons, spinning like a jet engine. 
Smaller equipment also means maintenance is cheaper and upgrades come faster. And it's not just small, it's powerful for its weight. Prototype SCO2 turbines have achieved net 10 megawatt outputs with rotors weighing under 100 kilograms, about 200 pounds, spinning at those dizzying 27,000 RPM. That's a power to weight ratio rivaled only by rocket engine turbo pumps. In practical terms, you could carry one SCO2 turbine on a truck and it would drive the same generator load as a huge steam turbine that fills a building. That insane power density means these turbines can potentially fit in places never thought possible. Ships, remote plants, or even on rigs. The bottom line? Tiny CO2 engines can deliver what big steam engines do. The efficiency gains are equally striking. Because of the high temperatures and the heat recovery, SCO2 cycles can reach thermal efficiencies around 50% or higher. By contrast, today's best coal or nuclear plants manage only about 30 to 40%. Pushing from, say, 35% up to 50% means almost 50% more electricity from the same fuel input. In one analysis, an SCO2 cycle delivered about 10 to 15 percentage points more efficiency than a comparable steam cycle. To put it in everyday terms, a power plant that once generated 1,000 megawatts might crank out 1,200 to 1,300 megawatts with supercritical CO2 from the same amount of heat. That's like lighting up a whole extra city with no extra fuel. This makes sense when you think about thermodynamics. Efficiency ultimately depends on temperature. SCO2 systems can operate at much higher hot temperatures than steam turbines can and still dump the waste heat at low temperatures, like ambient. That widens the temperature gap, Carnot's theorem, and lets you extract more work. In other words, it's like having a hotter, more powerful engine and a cooler exhaust, a win-win for turning heat into power. This is why these cycles can approach theoretical limits of efficiency more closely than steam cycles can. Another huge benefit is flexibility and startup speed. Steam plants have large boilers and water systems that need to heat slowly. It can take 30 minutes or more to go from cold to full power. An ECO2 plant, with its compact design, can start and reach power in just a few minutes. This lightning-fast ramp-up is perfect for modern grids that use a lot of wind and solar. You could have an ECO2 plant standing by, ready to roar to life whenever renewables dip. It's the difference between driving a hot rod and a cargo ship. 